Welcome into another edition of the Crimson Corner. I am your host, Michelle Bodkin, your Utah Utes insider on kslsports.com. And we are finally into game week. I am so excited. It's been a long time coming. It feels like it's been forever since this announcement was made that Utah and Florida were going to be playing each other. And it's finally here. It's finally here. We're all going to be traveling. We're all going to be in various parts of Florida, uh, hostile Florida takeover, both from the Utah and BYU end. However, this is the Utes, and we focus solely on them. So we uh, absolutely had to bring someone on that could give us the lowdown, the breakdown of what to expect from this year's Florida Gators team. Uh, you know, there's been some turnover on the coaching front as well as the player front, but Nobody knows what's going on better than uh, our guest here. He's part of the Locked On series, uh, Locked On Florida Gators. It's their host, Brandon Olson. Brandon, how's it going? Wonderful, and I'm so happy that football's back. (laughs) Right, as we all should be, I think. Uh, You know, give us just a general overview of what this Florida Gators team looks like. Uh, This Florida Gators football team, it's weird because so much of the expectations around them and their performance is just pure projection. You know, this is a team with a starting quarterback who has one start under his belt, and I think it's something like 40 pass attempts. (laughs) Like It's not a lot of experience there. It's a new running back room. The receivers are pretty much completely back. Offensive line is much improved, we're expecting, based on just adding Osiris Torrance and this coaching staff actually um, wanting to develop them. And then defensively, I mean, the front six is almost completely new, both as starters and depth. So it's all about projection with this team, which makes it very hard to say, you know, we expect them to win eight games, But at the same time, it's like we kind of know what we're expecting from them. It's just a matter of what will they actually put on the field? And is one offseason enough for Billy Napier and this coaching staff to really turn around the massive flaws that plagued this Florida Gators team in 2021? What are things that you guys have been noticing that have maybe been instant changes for this team since Billy Napier took over? Uh, discipline and camaraderie have been big things for Billy Napier. You know, he's switching up who sits where and who, or whose locker is where because he's like, hey, you know, essentially when you're playing football, you're going to war. And when you're going to war, it's not so much about hating the person in front of you. It's about loving the people next to you and behind you. And so he's thinking if we can get them to to develop these relationships and want to play harder for each other, then what happened last season with the team seemingly giving up on this coaching staff and everybody else around them. Hopefully we could avoid that this year. And just accountability has been a big thing. Like Billy Napier essentially kicked off three kids earlier in June because he was like, they're not buying into the program. They're not going to be Florida Gators. And so he got rid of them. And it's a lot of the off field stuff is that we're seeing where we're like, this is not something that's been around the Florida Gators program in a very long time because obviously even urban Meyer when Florida was winning natties he was not holding these players accountable for their actions but Billy Napier's was like if you don't want to be accountable and you don't want to buy in then you're not going to be a Florida Gator so it's a completely different atmosphere around Florida just off the field and then on the field as well I mean this defense is going to be much different I think because well first of all they're actually putting an emphasis on tackling which is going to be it's a, it kind of plagued Florida last year it's kind of pretty rough there but there's just so much about this team where it's a polar opposite to what we saw last season which is just a breath of fresh air in Gainesville Talk about uh, Anthony Richardson a little bit. I think he's a guy that has all the potential in the world. It didn't necessarily show up at all times last season. You know, how's he been looking? How do the coaches feel like he's come along in his game? The coaches seem to love him. They And Billy Napier has openly said, he's like, look, Anthony Richardson has immense potential, but he also knows that he has a lot of work to do to get there. I, I've said that Anthony Richardson reminds me of Josh Allen when he was coming out of college you know he was this incredibly raw athlete with a bazooka for an arm 
And I, I always bring up that Anthony Richardson hurdled a defender last season. Josh Allen hurdled, I think it was Anthony Barr in his rookie year. And I never want to see Anthony Richardson hurdle someone ever again, by the way. Um, but I think you've got someone who Anthony Richardson is one of the most physically gifted human beings on the planet. Just people that size do not move the way he moves. And if they do, they're usually playing receiver. They're not able to throw the ball 70 plus yards down the field. Um, so I, I think that Anthony Richardson, in just terms of ceiling, is incredible. But you're looking at someone who last year struggled with accuracy. He was a gamer. I mean, against LSU, he came in and balled out when he had to. Against Georgia, he struggled. But again, that was his first career start. And that was against arguably the most dominant defense that we've ever seen in college football. So I think that you're looking at someone who is just projection right now. He's this ball of clay or, I mean, if you want to call him coal and you can turn him into a diamond with enough pressure, but it's a matter of actually hitting that ceiling because the expectation with a lot of Gator Nation is Anthony Richardson is a Heisman caliber player, and he very well could be, but there's still a lot of work to go. I mean, I know I caught a lot of flack last year for watching him play some games, and while he was this big play threat, this gunslinger type, there were certain times where, and I've said this exact quote where, he couldn't hit the side of a barn if he was throwing the side of a barn. Like, like he was very inaccurate at certain times. And there was, you know, people making the excuse of he's throwing to backups. I don't care. As a quarterback, it's your job and your responsibility to get the ball to your receiver, whoever at it, whoever that is. We've seen offensive linemen go out for passes before and catch the ball, and they're not faster than these starting receivers. So I, I don't give that as an excuse to him. I will say again, I think he's got incredible potential but it's a matter of getting there in practice and in spring ball and in the spring game as well. He looked phenomenal, but that's going against people that you practice against every day and you know, their tendencies, they know yours, of course. So those may be balanced out, but that you're going against people who, you know, and it's a matter of, can you do it in game when it matters? Media only gets 14 minutes of media availability during every practice. And it's usually these one-on-ones or routes on air so you don't get to see a ton. Billy Napier's kind of kept everything close to the chest. But from what we've seen, Anthony Richardson looks good. But again, throwing him routes on air, it only matters if you struggle in routes on air. That's it. If you can complete passes against nobody, that means nothing. Well, I mean, that's 14 more minutes than we've seen in Salt Lake City. So <laughs> uh, Kyle Whittingham has closed practices. We have seen nothing. Uh, it's all word of mouth. Word of mouth sounds great, but uh, as we've seen in the past, uh, that doesn't always necessarily translate to the kind of start that we expect uh, based off of what's being said. With that, you know, how do you think the coaching staff is going to manage Anthony Richardson? You know, first game, uh, probably a better defense than typically you faced going into a first game, you know, how, how do they make sure that he's comfortable and does what they need him to do? I think, and I've been saying this literally since Billy Napier got hired. I was like, the first play of the game is going to be a run or just a deep shot. Like that, that's the only two expectations of mine on the first play of the game. Cause I think that they're going to want to get Anthony Richardson comfortable because he's the kind of guy where he can make every throw that a coach will ask of him but he will also make throws that a coach would never ask of anybody because they're not throws that should be made, but he's going to do that. So I think with Anthony Richardson, it's about tempering that mentality because he's a, he's a home run threat, whether he's running the ball or throwing the ball, he's a home run threat. I think that Billy Napier has kind of put a lot of emphasis on getting Anthony Richardson up to speed as far as IQ wise and being able to read a defense because he did struggle with that last year, despite what a lot of Gators fans will say. They're like, oh, no, he's fantastic. but And he is. I, I think he will be. But he's got room to grow. He's got a lot of work to do. And Billy Napier has said, you know, we put a lot of pressure and a lot of stress on our quarterbacks in the offseason because you're the quarterback. During the season, you're going to still have the most pressure and the most stress. So I think it's about getting Anthony Richardson up to speed mentally because physically he's obviously there as far as just the traits but getting Anthony Richardson up to speed mentally has to be the biggest thing. And Billy Napier is someone who is so detailed in everything he does that I think that that's something where he's probably crushing it with getting Anthony Richardson up to speed mentally. And that's part of the projection, of course, with Anthony Richardson is 
you've got a quarterback who is you've got a head coach who is one of the most detail oriented head coaches around like like i know that a lot of coaches when they talk about recruiting they write these two sentence summaries for players billy napier writes full scouting reports on these high school players so he he's one of the most detailed individuals around uh the the term that i've heard with a lot of these florida gators coaches is that they're nerds whether it's info nerds or analytic nerds whatever it is they're nerds they're going to put a ton of detail and a ton of um yeah just a ton of detail and a ton of emphasis on the little things and so i think that's huge for the development of anthony richardson as someone who has all the traits you just gotta mold him i i think that it's a lot of billy napier just focusing on getting the off field or not the off field but the uh mental part of anthony richardson's game up to snuff of course you know we all love a good quarterback, but a quarterback also is only as good as the weapons he has around him. You know, who should Utah fans be watching as far as, you know, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends that could possibly also be a big factor in how well Richardson does? I think Ricky Pearsall is the first name you have to bring up. He's an Arizona State transfer, so Utah fans might already be uh, a little familiar with that name, but he has just lit it up in every possible way since he got to Gainesville. He's the best route runner on the team, at least in my opinion, best route runner on the team. He's probably the shiftiest with the ball in his hands. Uh, Justin Shorter and Xavier Henderson are these big bodies that are going to be lined up on the outside more. Although with Louisiana, Billy Napier showed that he did like to bring a big X receiver type into the slot and work with that big slot, or I believe he calls it a power slot. Uh, So he's shown that he wants to work with those types of guys inside, but Ricky Pearsall has primarily been a slot receiver and he's been cooking from, (laughs) cooking from by all accounts. Ricky Pearsall has been the guy. Uh, I think another player that you have to look for is, Dante Zanders and Keon Zipper are the two tight ends. You're going to see a lot of two tight end sets from Billy Napier in Gainesville. There's a reason that they added four freshmen this season. They want to have tight ends on roster and they want to have them active and and contributing. So I think you're going to look at the tight ends, whether it's in the flats or down the seam. Those are going to be the two main areas you'll see them. Uh, You won't see many corner routes I'm expecting from tight ends. And then as a running back, I think you're looking towards Naquan Wright. Uh, He's, I think, should be the starter. I think there's going to be a running back by committee, of course, but I think that he'll be the one that sees the most time just due to his ability to contribute as a runner receiver. And he's probably the best pass protector on the team in that backfield. So I think that he's going to see the most time there and you'll probably see him work out a little bit of the slot during the season. Let's turn our attention over to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, You mentioned earlier that there was more turnover there than there was on the offensive side. You know, who are guys that Florida is going to be looking for to have a big game and try and stop Utah's offense? I think it starts with Javon Dexter, the defensive lineman who (laughs) he's, he played D tackle under Dan Mullen and Todd Grantham. He's playing defensive end, but he's going to be lining up in the same exact spot. He even said, he was like, look, a 3-4 DN is the same thing as a 4-3 D tackle in this defense. So that's what we're looking at with Javon Dexter. He's been just a one-man wrecking crew throughout his college career. It's just a matter of him doing it consistently because he's been the type where he makes a splash play on, you know, every second or third drive, but He's trying to put it together in a more dominant fashion. And I do believe that Sean Spencer, the giant, the Gators co-defensive coordinator and defensive line coach has been able to do that. Sean Spencer was with the New York Giants the last season as their defensive line coach when, and I mean, he's compared Javon Dexter to a mix of Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence. He's got freaky size and athleticism and he's been so dominant when he's on. It's just a matter of putting it together more consistently. And I mean, he's a new dad so now maybe now he's got dad strength and maybe he's just going to start wrecking people even more but i think it comes down to javon dexter and not even brenton cox jr but ventrell miller has to be the guy because ventrell miller missed the majority of last season a sixth year senior who is kind of put in this box as a run stopping linebacker and we're going to find out if he's still going to do that this year um, because he's been, I, I think he's going to be the green dot player for the Florida Gators, the one that communicates and makes the calls. Um, but I think it's going to come down to Jervon Dexter on that defensive line and Ventro Miller in the second level to see if you can really stop this Utah rushing attack, which I'd imagine they're just going to come out and try to punch Florida right in the mouth. I, it's been very interesting uh, hearing, you know, 
what Florida is planning on doing. They want to run the ball and stop the run. That's very much what Utah loves doing. It sounds like really honestly, this game, both sides are going to look more similar than I think they're going to look different. Uh, It's just going to be a matter of who does it better. Uh, You know, you did also kind of mention, actually, this maybe was in a podcast of yours that I was listening to more than what you mentioned here just now, Uh, but that stopping the run was a huge issue for the defense last year. It, It wasn't something that they were very good at. What has this coaching staff been doing to try and remedy that? I can tell you immediately. I had a Florida Gators uh, starting defensive lineman, Prince Liam and Mialine on the show a few months ago. And I asked him, I was like, what's the biggest difference between Todd Grantham's defense and this Patrick Tony defense? And he was like, well, we focus on the run. He's like, we try to stop the run actually. Uh, with last year, it was just, just go after the quarterback, go after the quarterback. And then you got gashed 300 something yards by LSU of all teams who struggled running the ball until they played Florida. And then they were like, okay, we're good now. Um, so I think putting that emphasis there and putting an, a legitimate, severe emphasis on actually being able to finish tackles. And mm-hmm. I mean, Jay Bateman, who is the linebackers coach and used to be the defensive coordinator with North Carolina Tar Heels, he's put an insane emphasis on tackling where they're doing these tackling drills. And if you don't get it right, he's going to make you repeat it. Even Ventrell Miller, who I mentioned is the Florida Gators, arguably best tackler on the team. He's been asked to repeat drills just because Jay Bateman's like, I don't like how you did it. Do it again. Uh, Patrick Tony, the co- the co-defensive coordinator and safeties coach, has talked about it's not just making the actual tackle because, of course, with the college football safety rules, you can't always go full contact. You can't do it back to back days and all these things. He's like, we do drills even when there's no contact. We do drills of just leading up and taking the correct angle because that's been such a major issue there. So this coaching staff has been, again, just being nerds and putting putting all the emphasis on the details there, which is huge. But I mean, when you look at last year, it's also there's been a ton of turnover on this defensive front where Dan Mullen didn't really make it. Um, it wasn't a secret that he would play seniors and upperclassmen and people that are his guys, quote unquote, um, over more deserving players. It's why Emory Jones started over Anthony Richardson, even though the Florida Gators players made it very openly known that they wanted to uh, to have Anthony Richardson as a starting quarterback. But Dan Mullen was like, Emory Jones is my guy. He, he's the one who, you know, he followed me to Florida. He's going to be a Gator. He's going to be our starting quarterback. So Dan Mullen openly played less deserving players because they were upperclassmen over the more deserving and arguably more talented players. Utah and Florida have a lot of commonalities. Uh, Urban Meyer is one, Dan Mullen's another, Brian Johnson, uh, Mumad Diabate. Do you think those kinds of things make this game more interesting, just having kind of those connections and familiarities? Absolutely, especially the Diabate one. Like I know that Ventro Miller during SEC Media Days, he even they asked him about the Utah game, and he's like, "Yeah, like we're excited for it, but like they took one of our own, so we we really want to go at them now." Uh, so I know Ventro Miller's looking forward to that, and they're kind of using that as a little little gas there and a little juice there. But uh, yeah, I think definitely that all the similarities and the parallels, just in terms of who has come through Utah and Gainesville, and and the similar play styles that we're expecting to see. And just, there's a lot of these about these teams that are pretty similar. And like you mentioned, it's just going to be who does it better. But I definitely think that adding all those factors of the off field and the historical stuff, I I definitely think that plays a factor in this game as well in terms of uh, hype. How is Florida doing in terms of health? I have seen some reports of people being banged up. There's maybe some questions whether they'll be ready to go. Are there any updates that you can give on that? Uh, Ricky Pearsall got banged up. He had a bone bruise in his foot, the uh, receiver that I mentioned earlier, but he's back to practice as of, uh, I believe it was Monday, he came back without a known contact jersey. So he was free to get hit all they wanted. Jason Marshall starting corner and I mean, Florida Gators projected corner one. Uh, he has been banged up, but he'll be ready for the Utah game. The expectation is most of the starters are intact. The issue is 
if they get injured, there's going to be some major problems. I mean, looking at Anthony Richardson, he got injured in high school. He got injured last season and his backup quarterback is currently injured. So if something were to happen to Anthony Richardson, the Florida Gators are um, very much out of luck in that regard. The offensive line has been relatively healthy. They actually just got one of their starting guards back from injury uh, or projecting starting guards back from injury. A lot of this team is getting healthy on the starters front and the depth is getting injured. So that's a, that's a bit of a concern. I definitely think, but hopefully going into the Utah game, most of these guys are going to be back. What are the matchups you're looking forward to most between Utah and Florida? Um, Like most people say, you know, how football is played in the trenches. That's what I'm looking forward to. Honestly, Mm -hmm. primarily Utah's offensive line against Florida's defensive line. I think they match up pretty well in terms of, you know, Utah's going to try to run the ball and Florida's defensive line last season, although it's very different people, struggled a bit stopping that run. I'm curious to see how Javon Dexter is going to take that next step. Who's going to be the Florida Gator starting nose tackle? Because there's pretty much three names in that conversation right now. Jalen Lee, Jalen Humphreys, or Desmond Watson. And uh, I kind of just want to see it be Desmond Watson because he's 400 plus pounds. Um, and I kind of just want to see him play consistently. But, I mean, the coaching staff has said, you know, we're working hard to get him in playing shape. So, doubt we're going to see that, although it would be fun. But I think those trenches are going to really be what decides this game. And then they're not going head-to-head, but Anthony Richardson and Cam Rising, I think, has to be a very big part of this game where it's Cam Rising is obviously an incredibly talented quarterback, makes very few mistakes. And Anthony Richardson is a very talented quarterback that – has made quite a few mistakes, but it's about correcting those because I think this game, no matter who wins, I think this game is going to be closer than a lot of fans on either sides. I know my YouTube comments get flooded with Utah fans that are talking about how this is going to be a four touchdown game. And even that's because Florida is going to score a touchdown late to close it and make it look a little bit better. And I know that I have Florida fans that are like, oh, they're going to wipe the floor with Utah. They're not ready for the humidity which could play a factor or will play a factor, but I think this is going to be a tight game. Um, And it really comes down to who makes more mistakes. And right now, obviously Florida is the team that has made more mistakes and has the players that has made more mistakes in the past. So I'm very excited to see how Cam Rising and Anthony Richardson kind of battle it out there. Talk about the game day atmosphere. Uh, This is the first time, I think, for a lot of Utah fans to kind of get a little taste of that SEC game day experience. You know, what what can people expect? A lot of noise and a lot of humidity. (laughs) That's that's really what it comes down to. I mean, when you're playing in the swamp, look, all respect to every other stadium, but there are very few stadiums that can replicate that swamp atmosphere you know 90,000 people is a lot of people to have there and then they make themselves very well known and very well heard they're you know rowdy reptiles whatever you want to call them they get loud and they are proud of their Florida Gators team and there's going to be a lot of crowd noise that I think at least again the Utah fans in my comments uh, aren't really anticipating that to play as big a factor as I think it will We've seen teams where, you know, you could play in a loud stadium because I know that they're, I know that I've had Utah fans go, Utah stadium is just as loud. Even if it is, it's not as loud when Utah's on offense, you know, they, they tend to quiet it down and the home crowd always quiets it down when your team's on offense and trying to make these plays and make these calls. That's not going to be the case in Gainesville. And the humidity is a very important factor. I think where people are like, Oh, so what? You just rotate people more often. Putting your backups on the field more often definitely puts you at some sort of disadvantage where you're talking about Salt Lake City, which uh, I believe it was last week I was looking at it. And it was like, oh, 19% humidity, where Gainesville is 90% humidity. There's a massive difference there. And maybe playing in that elevation will help people get gassed uh, or help people uh, prevent getting gassed a little bit. But it's also a very different kind of feeling that you've got as far as just playing in elevation and being more conditioned because of that and playing in a very humid area where you're going to be sweating. You're going to feel gross and disgusting and it's going to gas people a bit earlier. But also I think Florida might be hindered a little bit 
by that because although you practice there, you also practice indoors often now. You've got that nice field, you got that nice stadium, that facility that they just set up. Um, and I think that both teams are going to be affected by the humidity a bit, but obviously I think Utah is going to be affected more just because it's such a drastic difference from what they're used to where, I mean, people talk about the Utah staff, the Utah team practicing indoors and pumping the heat so that they're used to the heat. The heat ain't the problem. It's the humidity there that really gets people when you get into the swamp. It's called the swamp for a reason. Like it, it's gross, it's sweaty, and and it, it's humid. Um, I think those off-field factors are going to play a little bit more um than some people are expecting. But it, it's just gonna be an incredible, incredible atmosphere. I, I know that when we have a rain cloud come through, I want to cry because it feels humid to me. That's how dry it is here. Uh, so I, I'm not looking forward to this humidity thing. Um, I'm also saying that there's maybe it's going to rain. Uh, it looks like it's going to be rainy. How how does that change the climate at all? Uh, it's it's just going to make you even more gross. I'm sorry to tell you. That's <laughs> nice. Um, just, just I know that you know I have long hair. Just put it up. Don't worry about it. It's, it's gonna get it's gonna get messy. It's gonna be very gross. And I mean, on the bright side, I I feel like you might feel a little bit better if it's rain that's coming down on you instead of just sweat. You might feel a little less gross about it. Um, but that that's Florida. It's just it's gonna rain probably for you know, a few minutes, stop, rain for a few minutes and stop. But uh, luckily, both of these teams are going to try to run the ball. So it might not play a huge factor in the actual passing aspect. Where are cool places to go in Gainesville on game day that people should go check out? I think if you can get a spot at Spurrier's, uh, it's relatively close to the stadium that's a great restaurant bar spot where obviously a lot of people are going to be uh the social at midtown in Gainesville is a spot where I know that there's going to be I mean I'll be there the two days before the game maybe be there game day since it is right down the road but I know that there's an after party there um on Saturday after the game I know people will be there prior to the game and honestly if you're going to be in Gainesville I recommend catching just just tailgating um, th- that's going to be obviously a very fun, uh, environment and a very fun atmosphere where it's a lot of people who are very excited about this game. And I mean, th- the atmosphere around this Florida football team has not been here in a very long time, as far as, you know, new head coach, new quarterback with high expectations and just everything around this team is just buzz and starting against a team like Utah is something that you don't see from Florida often. So it just even more adds to that experience. So I really hate asking people for like score predictions. So I want to do this instead. Florida will win if. Oof. uh, I think Florida will win if this Gators defense lives up to expectations. Um, I, Cause I think that's really what it is where you talk about all the changes that they've made and Patrick Tony's implemented this new defense and, and it's going to a three men or a three down lineman scheme and, and all this stuff. I think it's really, if Florida can stop the run and force one or two turnovers, I realize asking two interceptions is a lot. So we'll say turnovers and hope that there's a fumble somewhere. Um, I think if it's Florida's defense just steps up and lives up to the expectations, because I do think that Anthony Richardson is going to be the kind of quarterback where he's going to give you some big plays and he's going to give Utah some big plays. So it's a matter of can this defense step up and kind of force some errors by Utah. And then on the flip side, Utah will win if. If Anthony Richardson does not live up to the hype at all, because that's obviously a thing where, I mean, I feel like I've been saying this all off season where Florida is so much a projection right now. And it's so much, it's so reliant on Anthony Richardson's progression and development. And if you can get him rattled, like last year, he showed that when he's pressured consistently, he's going to make some mistakes. He's going to apply some pressure on himself there. And in addition to the pass rush that's getting put on him, where uh, you look at the end of that LSU game, he threw a bad, 
bad interception. I don't care if it's, oh, he was being pressured. He was being rushed. He was trying to force something. Forcing things is what will kill you. So I think that if Utah can generate consistent pressure, uh, Anthony Richardson is going to have a bit of a difficult time. And if he can't get the ball downfield like he's going to want to do, then you're really looking at a, at a rough go. Well, that's some great information, Brandon. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm looking forward to hopefully running into you and actually finally meeting you at the Swamp. I know we tried uh, in Mobile earlier this year and it didn't work out. Hopefully game day works out a little bit better. Uh, for those of you listening, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope you learned some things about the Florida Gators, Utah's upcoming match on September 3rd. Again, football is here, guys, and it's very exciting. Until the next time, I'm Michelle Bodkin, your Utah Utes insider for kslsports.com. You've been listening to the Crimson Corner, and as always, go Utes. Yeah.